So, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to go through some of the questions that have been sent in before. And if you have further questions, please send them in to the SP Sangha or to Milton, and they'll come to me, and then we'll do them in, in time. So the first question I have is, since we can easily disturb each other, how should Dharma practitioners communicate? So from one point of view, uh, we should, of course, be very mindful, be calm and careful about how we behave so as not to create disturbance. But if you do this consciously, it becomes very artificial. So it's always good to check how your breath is. If you can keep your breath deep and slow with a relaxed diaphragm, then your openness to the world is calm and clear. In fact, this is a natural way of breathing. Our breath becomes shallow and quick when we become aroused by anxiety or excitement. And this occurs when we are in the power of the three root poisons. We take a situation to be real. And if we have excitement and, then, and desire, then the excitation is, is pleasurable. And if we have fear or anxiety, we have aversion, and then the arousal is not so pleasant. So the body should be relaxed and uh, pliable with the breath moving easily. And then with this uh, relaxation of the breath, the throat also relaxes, so our tone of voice can be uh, gentle and connective. And the, the more we do the uh, guru yoga practice, the more we have the experience or rather the, the presence of our relaxed open awareness. So then we're not trying to uh, get something more or get something less. It's life is okay as it is. Because when we feel happy, the happiness is arising and passing. When we are sad or upset, this feeling is arising and passing. We don't block it and try to get rid of it, but neither do we merge into it and uh, feel, oh, I am so sad, this is terrible, I don't want to be sad. Or this is, this is so pleasurable, this is wonderful, I hope it lasts forever. These uh, moments of experience are coming and going. So then we, we start to see that, just as the texts say, awareness is like the mirror, and what is arising is like a reflection. So it's the same when we meet other people, whether they are in the Sangha or in general, it is like a dream. It's not so real. People say something which you like and you feel happy. People say something you don't like, you feel sad. If you allow these momentary experiences to arise and pass, you're not grasping at them as constituents of your sense of self. And then, because you are not building yourself out of this, you, don't, you also don't build the other person into being a bad person because they make me unhappy or a or a good person because they make me happy. So what you have is moments of co-emergence. Nothing is established as something fixed. So in this way, we start to live with this intrinsic quality of impermanence or change or the flow. In that way, we can be connective, uh, responsive, but not um, constructive. And if somebody tells us that what we have said or done has disturbed them, then with feeling compassion, we can respond as is appropriate. You could apologize uh, or you could um, try to do something that will make them happy, or you can just be relaxed and open. Who is the person who has made this uh, person unhappy? 
without uh, trying to be a, a lawyer, without doing some funny language game, the truth is no one has made them unhappy. They are made happy by an interpretation. Their own mind has taken what was said or done as being something negative or harmful to them. Words came out of your mouth, but if you stay close to the practice, you realize your mind is like the sky. Just as the wind blows in the sky and shakes the, the leaves of the trees, in the same way, the, the wind blows up from your lungs through your voice box and some sounds come out. This is a sound and emptiness, which is taken up, uh, interpreted by the other person as being something unpleasant for them. Of, you, we always try to find the middle way. If you say, oh, well, but it's just sound and emptiness, this is being disrespectful towards their lived experience. But if you take their experiences too real and you become very apologetic, then it makes the experience more solid. Oh, staying calm and clear, present with the arising and passing of phenomena. This is how we should communicate. And especially don't give people things they don't want. People through their postures and their appearance of their face show whether they are available or not. If they are not available, then you can be silent. But I need to say, I want to say. So this is the moment you need to remember your practice. Who is the one who needs to say? Who is the one who must speak? So when we realize that this is a, a kind of uh, tension or vibration, uh, a like a kind of libido, a prana energy that wants to release itself out, instead of releasing it into the space in front of us so that it goes to the other person, we can release it into the space of the mind. We don't have to activate any thoughts or feelings or memories or intentions. They are potential, potential of a method of, of how there is compassionate connectivity. And the method cannot be decided just from one side. It's not because the other person says, I must have you behave in this way. It's not because I feel I have to behave in this way. But in the non-duality of our being present together with the fine attunement to the shared field of energy, then we speak or we don't speak. So it's always the same. Don't push your mind out into the world and try to work out what is going on. And don't hold your mind inside in the familiar labyrinth of uh, your expectations and assumptions, but just stay relaxed and available. And trust the spontaneity of your manifestation. If you're not spontaneous, if you're planning and thinking about what to do and to say, then you're situating yourself apart from what is going on. You're managing yourself in relation to others. And this is not our practice. It's not that it's wrong or bad to manage yourself, but it will keep your sense of who you are inside duality. If we think back to this basic teaching on karma, and karma begins with not recognizing the empty ground of our presence. And on the basis of that, I feel I am this separate person and you are this separate person and I have some knowledge of you. And on the basis of that, I develop an intention. This is how samsara is maintained. But the subject, the object, and the connection are all arising in an instant. And if you stay relaxed and present, you, you will experience, oh, well, you won't, uh, rather, you, it will be revealed to you that this is the flow of experience. And then you trust, oh, experience moves as it moves. And so your body will form to speak or respond to someone. 
without you having to, to think about why you are behaving the way you are. This doesn't mean that you're unconscious and unaware because this kind, this uh, quality of spontaneity is itself clarity. It's uh, uh, transparent and self-revealing. Okay, so the next question is um, regarding the three levels of transmission, uh, especially the symbolic transmission. So this is one way of talking about how the Dzogchen teachings came into the world. The first level of transmission is, uh, in a sense, not a transmission, because the mind of the Buddha is infinite. So you can send a, a letter from Spain to France, but they are different countries and you have a postal service that links across. But you can't send a letter from one infinity to another infinity. The infinite has no limit, no border. In the infinite, everything is already there. So this uh, first level of transmission is called Java Gombigyut, which means the, the clarity of the mind of the Buddha is itself the transmission. The Buddha is sitting with the openness of the mind, the Dharmakaya. So uh, there is no content which makes the Dharmakaya the Dharmakaya. It's not qualified by any situation. For our ego, if we are happy, that feels different from being sad because our ego self is qualified by its current content. And I have tea in my cup. So then I don't want to put orange juice inside as well because at the moment, this is a teacup and that becomes a limit to what is possible with the cup. When the tea is finished, then I could put in orange juice. But so this is the how our ego is. It's filling and emptying with transient content, which determines its uh, quality of um, being here. But the mind of the Buddha is open, vast like the sky. Inside this clarity, many th different uh, appearances are possible. So the non-difference between the openness of the Buddha's mind and the clarity of the Buddha's mind is how the first transmission becomes a second level of transmission. So, <clears throat> for example, on a, on a perfect uh, summer's day, we have big blue sky. The cloud arises in the sky. The cloud is a quality of the sky. The openness of the sky is not damaged by the cloud. So if you really see the, the sky, you see that its capacity to reveal aeroplanes, clouds, smoke, and so on, are signs of its uh, creativity, its radiance, its display. So the second level of um, transmission is called the Rigzindaigut, which means the transmission by the symbols of the Rigzin, who are the, the, those who manifest awareness. So for example, if we look at the sky and we see a lot of cloud, looking from a dualistic point of view, we think, oh, the cloud is spoiling the sky. I want the, the cloud to go away so I can see the sky. But for these uh, Rigzins, for the great yogis, the enlightened ones, it's obvious that there is only a cloud possible in the sky because the sky is empty. So a rainbow is a symbol of the emptiness of the sky. A cloud is a symbol of the emptiness of the sky. From the point of view of duality, you say the sky is one thing, the cloud is another. But the view for, for the uh, yogi, the enlightened yogi, she is able to see that what manifests is not other than the emptiness of the sky. And so the cloud is not blocking the sky. Whatever arises in the mind is not dulling the mind. The fact that it appears clarity of the mind. So sometimes we feel happy, sometimes we feel sad. 
happy it feels maybe light and expansive and sad feels more heavy and sinking they are there and then they're gone so you can take these experiences as conditioning yourself or we can see it directly as the display of the potential of the mind the mind and the individual ego personality are not the same the mind itself is empty of self-substance pure from the very beginning it's not marked or touched by anything so it has no bias of getting advantage or disadvantage the sky is not improved by rainbows or made ugly by clouds for for our ego self we might prefer the rainbow to the cloud you say the rainbow is good the cloud is bad but this doesn't tell us about the intrinsic quality of the rainbow and the cloud it tells us about ourselves this is when i look out of my limited self-referential position then rainbow is good cloud is bad but in terms of the openness of the mind which is the level of the first transmission whatever is arising in the mind is a symbol of the creative potential of the mind so it <clears throat> The symbol here doesn't mean like Vajra and Bell. That would be more a kind of tantric way of looking at things, that there are special uh, religious symbols. From the Sokshin point of view, everything which occurs is a symbol of the unborn openness of the mind. There is a mood of equanimity, and so everything can be enjoyed. The cloud is a cloud. It has its uh, way of appearing. It is the appearance of emptiness. The rainbow is also an appearance of emptiness. So the second transmission is being able to see everything which occurs as the spontaneous generosity or display of emptiness itself. And this transmission is uh, 360 degrees all the time, all at once, always all at once. Whatever is occurring, oh, this is the mind showing, this is the mind showing. From this clarity, this non-dual clarity of appearance and emptiness, an appearance which is light and sound, in order to connect with beings whose nature is light and sound, but who take themselves to be sentient beings, individual people who have been born, who are living and who will die. These beings need to be introduced to how they actually are. They are full of concepts and ideas and beliefs which are misleading. For example, uh, a person might believe I am Spanish. This is who I am. I am a Spaniard and I will die for Spain. But is it proper and correct that someone from Barcelona should die for the people in Madrid? The people in Madrid, come on. Are they really Spanish? Why would I die for them? No, 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 no. I, I will die for Barcelona. Which part of Barcelona will you die for? The north or the south, the east or the west? In every town, people dislike bits, uh, people from other areas of the town. In this way, we see that the basis of identity is always conceptual, not actual. So Barcelona is a concept. Madrid is a concept. The government can try to wrap it in one big concept, Spain. But the, the glue of that concept is getting a little thin. We see this in politics all over the world. So for beings wandering in samsara, they are taking concepts and ideas and memories and sticking them together to make shapes. So if the Buddha simply came and pointed at the cloud and the rainbow, people say, hey, what, what? why are you pointing? What are you doing? So for us, it's necessary to hear something in our ear. So this is the, the transmission through the whole 
the ear hole of the person. This is a difficult kind of transmission. It's um, a kind of homeopathic transmission. We are addicted to concepts. We are so addicted to these concepts, we, we don't know how to make sense of things without them. So the Buddha's transmission is using language to try to deconstruct language. When we're speaking and hearing, we, we grasp at the meaning. We believe that the meaning is in the sound. If the meaning was really in the sound, everyone would understand each other's languages. Your knowledge of your languages and the sound expressing these languages joins together and that creates meaning. So when we see this, then we see, oh, meaning is production, meaning is movement. Words depend on the context for their meaning and not just for their uh, semantic meaning. So if I say hot summer's day walking on the beach, that will sound very different if it's said in August or in November, because in November you think, oh, please come quickly next summer. So every time we are speaking, there are pulsations and patternings of meaning which are emerging according to many different factors. So the primordial Buddha, uh, Samantabhadra, made, gave the transmission to Dorji Semba. Dorji Semba transmits this directly to Garab Dorji. In Garab Dorji, who is not a human being, but manifests as an apparitional form of a human being, he manifests in the world with human beings and teaches how we actually are. He gives the motro, this uh, direct introduction or direct showing of how we are. So he says, look at your mind. Don't look outside at these appearances. Don't look halfway inside at the thoughts and feelings that are arising. But look at the looker. Some experiences arising. Who is the one who is aware of this? This is your mind. Stay with the one who is aware. Oh, this is what he says. On the basis of this, many, many thousands of books have been written. And then we read all these books. And while we are reading these books, we are not looking at our mind. So we don't do what Garab Dorji said. We look for the words. He didn't say look for the words. He said look for the mind. But he said it in words. And I've got it written down. And I have now five different commentaries of what he said. So I need to keep reading these commentaries till I understand the word. But it's not so complicated. Look at your hand. I have a hand. I have eyes. I look at my hand. Oh, that is my hand. This doesn't require years of study. You have a mind. You are not dead. Your mind is illuminating what is happening. Look for your mind. I can't find it. But it's here. But every time I look, I don't find it. What do you find? Thoughts, memories, imaginations, the shopping list for tomorrow. Oh, you see what is in your mind, moving around in your mind. If you didn't have a mind, how could that be moving in the mind? The rainbow and the cloud are in the sky. Your thoughts, memories are in your mind. If you see your thought, you will see your mind. But you have to see your thought, not fall into your thought. Don't fuse with the thought. Don't stand apart from the thought. Whatever is occurring in the mind, moment by moment by moment, be with this. This is it. This is the openness of the mind, filling and emptying, filling and emptying. So this is the third transmission. So this third transmission is for us. We are human beings. But for most of us, we would rather read words about the mind than look at the mind. That's because we are stupid. How are stupid people going to wake up? 
by looking and seeing who is the one who is stupid. Who is stupid? I am stupid. James is stupid. Who is James? I am James. What is the quality of James? Stupidity. This is a very good way of making yourself stupid because you believe the name you believe the word which describes the quality. And so your consciousness, your dualistic consciousness is resting on the idea of self, of your personal identity, your name, and so on. This is the cloud. Although the cloud is inseparable from the sky, if you only see clouds, how will you know what the sky is? This is why <clears throat> Sometimes in the practice we say, put is a way to open up a space in the clouds so we see the sky. Clouds are not the enemy of the sky. Thoughts are not the enemy of awareness. Thoughts are the energy of awareness. But when we don't see them in this dynamic manifesting and vanishing immediacy, we grasp at them as something and then build them up into a big wall of identity. And this is why this third transmission is so difficult because it's using words to say, look through the words. Thoughts are empty, They're like a rainbow. Something is there, but nothing is there. But when we have this uh, dualistic attachment, we always see the something is there bit and don't see the other bit that nothing is there. So it's very, very important not to use Dharma to solidify your ego identity. If you really understand Dharma, you will get nothing. So then you can impress your friends. I am nothing, I have nothing, and I hope I never have anything. I don't think this will count as pride because no one will admire you. We see in America that the president doesn't want to become nothing. I am something, I am something. He, he doesn't see that something is nothing. Every something is nothing, every nothing is something. So this is the level of the third transmission. You have to be very precise to look at language without falling in. In the general Buddhist text, it says samsara is like a swamp. If you walk in a swamp, if you're not careful, you stand on the mud and you start to sink in. And the more you struggle, the more you push your feet down into the mud. So they always say that you should put your arms out and try to rest flat on top of the surface. So this is like our meditation instruction. Don't struggle. Don't make effort. You just become more and more involved in thought after thought after thought. So that's a brief outline of these three uh, transmissions. So now we have another question. Uh, how do we make progress if we have no time to be with teachers and go on long retreats? Well, as we have looked uh, many times, we are not going anywhere. So the very notion of progress is unhelpful. We are here, but we don't know how to be here. But we are here. So what, what, if I am here, how would I need to know how to be here? Because I am here. So I am here, but my mind is going there and there and there. That is to say, something is happening in my body, some sensation. And then I follow the sensation. I scratch it or I like it. One thing leads to another. Plans feed into other plans. Memories feed into other memories. These are all kinds of progressions or journeys. But we don't want to make any progress. We want to simply be here. The Dharmakaya, the pure aspect of the mind, never moves. Like the sky, everything moves through the sky, but the sky doesn't move. So you will know when you are making progress if you are not making progress. But this is not a making or not making progress done by anyone. 
So why am I doing it? What would be the point of meditating if, we're, if I don't get anywhere? When you have this kind of thought, you are pulling meditation into the familiar paradigm of samsara. In samsara, especially for the human beings, we are always concerned with profit. So if you have animals, you hope that they will give birth to two or three babies every year. This is how the farmer can make a profit. He plants the seed and gets the corn and then keeps some of the corn for planting next year. So he has excess. So more becomes a sign of progress. And less is not a sign of progress. But in terms of meditation, we want to have less. If you are doing a tantric visualization, you want the visualization to become stronger and clearer because that is something that you can do. But we sit and we're just there. This is not something that we do. We find ourselves here when we don't do going elsewhere. Going elsewhere, that is activity. Going after a past thought, waiting for the next thought, judging whether you're making any progress. These are all activities. So our goal is to step out of success and failure, winning and losing, gain and loss. This is not what we want to do. So, and then there's a second part to this question. What kind of progress can I expect to make? The less you do, the more easy it is to be present. Now, that doesn't mean that nothing at all happens. What they say, there are two aspects of the mind. Now, in Buddhism, there are many ways of describing the mind. None of them is true because it cannot be expressed. So when we use these different kinds of descriptions, we have to take them very lightly. But in Sokshen, we say that that the mind is primordial purity and a kind of spontaneous here-ness and instant presence. If you look for the mind, you can't find anything. And yet the mind shows itself by all these experiences which occur. The more you see that you don't need to make progress, that you, your familiar sense of self, your individual personality with your particular qualities, being good at mathematics or foreign languages. This is a quality of the energy of intelligence. It is constructive. What it constructs is painting on water. Appearances arise and then vanish. There's nothing wrong with this. It's how it is. But where is this movement arising from? If I take a dualistic, egoistic reading, I am doing it. So I am speaking just now. I am speaking words. Who is doing this? I am doing it. But when we speak in this way, I don't know what I'm going to say. So if I said I'm going to make a cup of tea, I can go in the kitchen and get all the ingredients and make the cup of tea. Before I go to the kitchen, the cooker, the kettle, the tea bag, the cup, I know what I need. But when I'm speaking just now, I don't know what I'm going to say. So I make the tea. I am the agent, the one who is doing it. But I'm speaking words I don't know. I hear them in my own ear. Who is speaking out of my mouth? I am happening to me as me. That is to say, the ground of me being me is not me. The ground of me is space. Not a dark space, but space illuminated by the sun of awareness. That light illuminates this particular setting. So I'm looking at a computer screen. I'm seeing images of some people I recognize. 
So although I'm talking in the room all by myself, it is as if I'm talking to you, with you, and this perception of you with me lets the words arise. The words are co-emergent with the field of clarity, which is inseparable from emptiness. So <clears throat> we have to trust, it's okay. The paradox is the less you judge, the less you evaluate, as long as you are present, it's fine. Now, if you don't judge and you don't plan, but you're not present, what you do is likely to be very self-referential. Our presence reveals the field. I'm looking at the screen and the big picture on the screen is Juan. So this is arising. Now I can say the screen is the object and I am the subject looking at the screen. But I also can have a sense of my hands and the little tension in my neck because of the angle for looking at the screen. These are things that I am aware of. So I'm aware of the image of Juan as an object. I'm aware of my neck as an object. I'm aware of my thoughts about my neck as an object. So on the level of object, the image of Juan in front of me and my thought about my neck are both objects. Juan is a content of my mind. I am a content of my mind. So in Sokshen, it's most essential we see the mind, we awaken to the mind. I am the movement of the energy of the mind. I am not the mover of the energy of the mind, but I am patterns of the movement of the energy of the mind. So when we see this, the question, am I making any progress, becomes not so meaningful. Because the one who might make progress, the individual ego self, we start to see, oh, this is an illusion. This is a pattern of the movement of the energy of the mind. From the morning to the night, energy is moving in patterns. Some of these look outside us, some of them look like inside us. There is no one to make progress. And yet movement, diversity of appearance is continuously manifesting. And then there's the third aspect to this question was, can I trust non-meditation? You have to look. I'm not selling secondhand cars. If you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, you don't do it. We say, this is wonderful. Why? Because then you're pinning some quality onto what is occurring. Dharma is marvelous. But sometimes, as we know, Dharma is boring. So whatever you say about it, it's going to fall away from it because that dharma is everything. Okay, so we have already done the next question. Uh, okay, so then the next one is kindness and Tonglen and non-duality. So in Tonglen, we exchange our situation for that of other beings. We say, I give you all my happiness, I take all your suffering. From the point of view of compassion, this is because we want to be able to get close to other people. And that means not to stay sealed inside our separate sense of self. But just as we think all sentient beings have been my mother in a previous life, we also imagine I could be born as an animal or a fish in the sea or in a hell realm. At this time, I have this body reasonably healthy and free in a Western bourgeois democracy. This arises due to causes and conditions. With climate change and political change, the social and economic situation of our countries is likely to change a great deal. You can see that a lot of suffering is easy to come. But what about me? I, I want to be safe but these people want to be safe. I don't know about them. I don't care about them. I care about me. Why should I care about the people in Africa? 
But as soon as you are thinking about Africa, where is Africa? Africa is now in your mind. South Africa, Nigeria, Niger, many kinds of Africa. The more I think about Africa, the more Africa gets close to me. The reason I am close to me is because I think about me quite a lot. I get a lot of information about me through sensation and hunger and desire and so on. I become real for myself because of being in this constant stream of information. President Trump understands this very well because he becomes very real for many people because he is appearing on their Twitter account and on television and on the media all the time. You can never know how he will be. Will he do this? Will he do that? This is wonderful. He is able to hook more attention and more attention. So he becomes more real, more potent than this very nice democratic man who is so quiet. In terms of marketing, all publicity is good publicity. So we each give for ourselves a lot of marketing. So moment by moment, you get a news flash. Oh, my back is sore. Oh, oh, my bum needs to move a bit. That is to say, our identity is created out of patternings of streams of information. So when we open ourselves with compassion, we pay more attention to information about other possible lives, the eight hot hells, the eight cold hells, and so on. So as we were looking at the end of the previous question, I am a flow of disclosure or experience arising in the luminosity of my mind. And so, is, uh, and so are all sentient beings. When I think about them, they be, start to become more visible, more palpable, more significant for me. The more I pay attention just to myself, <clears throat> this thickens my sense of self. And the more I think of other people, it brings them out of the shadows and they can appear. And the more I give attention to them, I'm giving less attention to me. So my sense of self for me starts to thin. And my sense of other people goes from being just a vague abstract idea to some sense of, oh, they suffer, they like, they don't like. So now self and others start to balance. I am an apparition, an illusory form. I am appearance and emptiness. And this is the, the same with the people in Africa and in South America and on different planets. You have appearance, but no internal defining essence. I have no inherent existence. I don't exist as James because of Jamesness, because how James manifests or appears depends on the context, on what James is connected with. The more, <clears throat> excuse me, the more I focus on myself, I, I think I am this one person. But if we go to work, if we relate to other people, we realize I laugh a lot with that person and I'm a bit scared of that person. So I have the potential to be scared or to be happy. The scary person is also nice for me because it reminds me, oh, I can get scared. Who is the one who gets scared? And the person who makes me laugh, oh, who is the one who laughs? So every person that we meet is like a mirror that lets us see angles and aspects of ourselves we didn't know. I am relational. I, I arise moment by moment in dependent co-origination. And the more situations I connect with, the more aspects of this potential I see. None of these aspects is my true self, who I really am, because I am simultaneously all of them and none of them. Oh, and maybe everyone is like this. So when I hear myself making a strong judgment or conclusion about someone, I am putting them in a box. Why? Because I don't want to be in a box. 
there is no box big enough for all my potential. They have the same ground source, which is the Dharmakaya infinite emptiness. So maybe they don't fit in a box. And by putting them in a box, I make myself stupid because I imagine that they are my idea of them. And so I don't need to look at them because I know, I know what they are. Now I'm back in a box. The whole world is just an echo chamber of my thoughts about myself and other people. So just as I look, who am I? And I don't want to be seduced by ideas about myself. I want to see in the same way, who are you? I want to see. I don't want to cover you in my ideas or to be captivated by your ideas about who you are. Then we start to see everything is appearance and emptiness, sound and emptiness, taste and emptiness, smell and emptiness. Appearance is the appearance of emptiness. You can't say it's nothing at all because it appears. You can't say that it's real because it's empty. So this is a, the way we can take up this exchange of Tonglen and take it deep into our practice. So this brings us to the end of our short time together this evening. So thank you to Juan and Milton for translating and to Pedro and Yao for organizing. And we have a few other Wednesday evening events which are on the website. So we say goodbye to everyone. Adios. Adios. Oh. James, adios. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.